Welcome to Module 6. We're going to spend a bit of time on some topics in Chapter 7 entitled Multifactorial Traits and then hone in on Chapter 8 entitled Genetics and Behavior. Genetics and behavior is certainly a deep topic, something you could spend a semester or more covering. In this lecture, we're ultimately going to cover some of the most important aspects of genetic behavior. However, uh, in this module, I want to go and take a glimpse back at Chapter 7. We skipped over Chapter 7 with last module. However, there are some things I'd like to bring in so that we can build a foundation for Chapter 8. We're going to look at some of the foundational material to help us with genetics and behavior. We'll define multifactorial traits. We'll consider the concept continuous versus discrete or continuous versus discontinuous traits. We'll spend some time defining heritability, and then we'll finish with some discussion of adoption and twin studies. Then moving on into chapter eight, we'll consider the precise definition of behavior. We'll review the process of neurotransmission and what happens at a synapse between two neurons. We'll cover various behaviors, sleep, intelligence, and intellectual disability, drug addiction, major depressive disorders, bipolar disorders, uh, schizophrenia. We're going to cover schizophrenia twice in terms of some material in chapter seven and in chapter eight, as well as we'll look at autism spectrum disorder. In looking at these various behaviors, we'll consider the genetic components briefly, but spend maybe even more time understanding the disorders themselves. I find chapter eight is more of a challenge for me to teach given the fields of genetics and behavior is still being considered so heavily. And some of the things we've considered to date, we have 100 up to 150 years of examination. In terms of behavior, we've only just recently mapped the human genome, and we're currently looking for target areas in our genome that might explain some of these behaviors. Added to that, we find many genes may contribute to a disorder, something we've referred to as polygenic, as well as looking at the environment having a say or coming into play as we look at how these behaviors unfold. Multifactorial inheritance. This is our first topic. And again, this is going back to chapter seven. So please refer to your textbook, chapter seven for this. Multifactorial inheritance is best described as inheritance by a combination of genes or genetic factors, and in some cases, non-genetic factors, such as the environment, each with only a relatively small effect. And I really like what our tech textbook says, genes underlying a multifactorial trait are not more complicated than others. They follow Mendel's laws, but contribute only partly to a trait. And again, I want to emphasize, don't confuse multifactorial inheritance with the term polygenic. Polygenic simply means the activity of one or more genes. When we talk about multifactorial inheritance, we are looking at genes as well as the environment. So do keep that straight as we move forward. Chapter seven considered the differences between what we call quantitative and qualitative genetic char characteristics and why the expression of some characteristics varies continuously. So what are these continuous and discontinuous traits, uh, quantitative, qualitative traits? So first of all, a quantitative trait, sometimes considered continuous trait. These are traits that must be described in a quantitative manner. We're using some kind of quantitative measurement. Examples for this include height, weight, blood pressure. In quantitative traits, the relationship between genotype and phenotype is typically very complex, being influenced, influenced by many genes, each of which has a very small effect on the phenotype. And how does the term continuous fall into this? When we look at it, um, continuous traits are sometimes referred to as quantitative because they can theoretically assume any value between two extremes. And so this is an example right here. We're looking at birth weight and birth weight. We can go, um, these are in grams. So we would go um, from our 2,500, 3,000, 3,500, 4,000, but even numbers in between those 2,500, 2,600, 2650, 2700, and we can even move between those 2600, 2601, 2602, 2603, etc. We have the ability to 
assume any value between two extremes. The number of phenotypes is limited only by our ability to precisely measure them. In contrast, when we look at these qualitative traits or what we call discontinuous traits, these are traits where the relationship between genotype and phenotype is much more straightforward. Each genotype produces a single phenotype, and most phenotypes are encoded by a single genotype. That is what we've considered when we looked at Mendel's P experiments, and unfortunately, it isn't something we see all that often in um, humans and in nature. Multifactorial traits are influenced both by multiple genes, that polygenic idea, and the environment. And the concept of the term heritability was developed in order to separate their relative roles. And I warn you, the information with this slide is going to be long. So heritability is a very useful measure because even when the actual genetic basis of a trait isn't known, the importance of the genetic components in its causation is indicated by its heritability. The higher the heritability, the more important the genetic factors contributing toward a trait. So let's go ahead first and define heritability. Heritability, and I've, I've given you two um, types of explanations or definitions here. Heritability is the estimate of the variance within a population that is due to heredity. Put another way, heritability can also be defined as the proportion of a population's phenotypic variation attributable to genetic factors. And this concept can and is quantified by saying the percent of variation of traits due to genes. We're going to be honing in or focusing on a number. But for the scope of this course and the statistics and calculations and studies that are needed to come up with the calculation of heritability, I will provide you with heritability numbers rather than ask you to really understand the process involved in calculating the numbers. So let me give you an example. Assume a small population in a coastal town in New England, or it could be a coastal town in Oregon, where nutrition is very normal, is very expected, is very boring, is very repetitive, has a heredity value of 0 0.7 for height. So we're looking at this New England town, somewhat isolated, Everyone has very good access to food, but it's all very similar food. We have a heritability factor or value of 0 0.7 for height. That indicates that 70% of the variation in adult height among all those individuals of that given population can be attributed to genetic variation. So I'll say that again. 70%, so if we have this heritability value or a factor of 0.7 for height, we are saying that 70% of the variation in that height among all of the individuals of a very specific population, this coastal New England town, is attributed to genetic variation. And we can compare that, I, I hesitate to say it that way, but we're going to look at another um, population. Compare that value to that of a developing nation so maybe this is third world developing country where some individuals are maybe a region. Some individuals might receive adequate nutrition. Others are severely deficient in nutritional factors. Since greater differences in diet exist in the developing nation, the environmental variance for height might be larger. And as a result, the heritability factor for height for this developing nation could potentially be less or smaller. And let's say it ends up being 0.5 for height. That indicates that 50% of the variation in adult height among individuals of a population is attributable to genetic variation. Again, developing nation, some have access to food, some do not have access to good food. And as a result, those differences, we say, if there is a heritability factor of 0.5, that indicates that 50% of our total variation amongst that population in the developing nation is attributable to genetic variation. So how is it possible to have two populations with different hereditary values? 
Remember, genes are not the only factor that influence height in a given population. Diet is another environmental effect. Maybe others, not, not only do we have dietary issues, but some, maybe some young, very young children have to go out and begin working in fields or doing heavy um, manual labor. And as a result, their bodies don't develop the way that the bodies in the um, isolated coastal town of New England may develop. So I want you to think about that. Now, I want to talk about some of those limitations of heritability. And there are four that I want you to know. There are certainly more than four. But first of all, I want you to understand these four. First, individuals do not have heritability. So if you remember back to what I've just said, I've said populations. We had a, an isolated population of a New England town, coastal town. We have a population in a developing third world country. So individuals do not have heritability. Heritability factors are statistical values based on the genetic and phenotypic variances found in a group of individuals, a population. Imagine we conduct a study on the height of students in the genetics class that we're taking, and we maybe we obtain a hereditary value or a factor of 0.6. We could say or we could conclude that 60% of the variation in height among students in our genetics class is determined by gene variance. What we couldn't say is that 60% of any individual student's height is due to genetic variance. That doesn't make sense. So we have to be considering a population. Next, there is no universal heritability for a characteristic. Values are specific to a given population in a given environment. So we could take our genetics class, which could be compared to a welding class, which could be compared to a writing class. Those would all have different populations. And so we can't say that everyone from those three classes could um, end up we couldn't say that there was one heritability factor for all three. I mean, we certainly could if we took all those into one population. But if we looked at them as separate populations, we can't say that there is some kind of a universal heritability factor for a given characteristic. Third, a high heritability value or factor does not mean that environmental factors cannot influence the expression of a characteristic. High heritability simply indicates that the environmental variation to which a given population is being exposed to is not responsible or is less responsible for variation in a given characteristic. And so let's look again at human height. In most developed countries, the heritability of human height is high, indicating that genetic differences are responsible for most of the variation in height. It would be wrong for us to conclude however, that human height cannot be changed by changes in an environment. Certainly, one great example, an unfortunate example of this, is height that decreased in several European cities during World War II, owing to hunger and disease. And height can be increased dramatically when we consider even the administration of growth hormone in children, which is another environmental factor. Hormones are an internal environmental factor in that case. Ultimately, the absence of environmental variation in a characteristic doesn't mean that the characteristic won't respond to environmental pressures at another time. So we're looking at a population at a given time. Finally, heritabilities indicate nothing about differences among populations. It doesn't provide information about the nature of population differences of a given characteristic. It's specific to a given population in a given environment at a given time. And I'll give you an example of this one. Imagine we measure heritability of height in two populations. Again, one population is from the small isolated community where everyone consumes high protein diet and people are tall. There's little variation in environmental factors because we're looking at one community and heritability of height in this group is high. Another population, maybe we look at a village of a, develop, a developing country with a low protein diet and their height is several inches shorter than that of the high protein population. Yet they too have little variation in environmental factors and the heritability of this group is high as well. What does that mean when both populations have high heritability and average heights differ considerably among the two populations? 
we might be tempted to conclude that the difference in height between the two groups is genetically based, that people in the developed country are genetically taller than people in the developing country. And the temptation to think this is wrong. That conclusion is wrong because the difference in height can largely be due to diet and environmental factor. Ultimately, again, heritability provides no information about the causes of differences between populations. Again, we must look at heritability within a given population. And lastly, there's a point I want to make. If we say height of a given New England population had a heritability value of 0.7 or 70%, what we are not saying, we are not saying that 70% of height is genetic. What we are saying when we use that heritability factor is that the difference or the variance in height within a given population can be accounted for um, or is 70% attributed by genetic differences. Now, before we leave this topic, I want to give you two common examples that are typically used to emphasize the point of heritability both of which come from a psychology class. So Mark Twain, the famous author, once suggested the following. Suppose you raised four unrelated boys in barrels beginning at age 12. This is awful, I know, but it's, it's an example. So we have a barrel, two, three, and these are all identical barrels. I don't draw well, so they don't look all that identical. The four boys are isolated from one another and isolated from the rest of the world, but they're fed and their environments are kept clean. And what's more important, their environments are the same. They are controlled similarly. So we have boy one, boy two, boy three, boy four. Again, my drawing is not great. You don't take this class to look at my art. Now, when these four boy boys are removed from these barrels at age 16, four years after they were placed in the barrels, they have their IQs measured. And we discover, not surprisingly, that their IQs might be lower in comparison to the population around them. They may have some differences in IQ amongst themselves, of course. But these differences between the four wouldn't be attributed to in the environment because they had the same environment. I can't say it's a wonderful environment. It's a pretty terrible environment, if you ask me. But if they have IQ differences, it shouldn't be attributed to environment as we controlled the environment. We would say that their IQ differences should have a heritability value of approximately one or hundred percent heritability. Maybe not exactly, but very, very close because environments were nearly a hundred percent the same. Now we can look at another example. Let's imagine we have four identical quadruplets. So now four identical quadruplets. So these are monozygotes, they share 100% of their genetic information. So we have number one, number two, number three, number four. Okay. All four children separated, raised in different environments. Maybe one was raised in the desert. We had another that was raised in the rainforest. We have a third that was raised in a big city, a big metropolitan area. And then we have a fourth that was raised in space, maybe at the International Space Station. We would expect the heritability of an intelligence, that IQ value for these four children, would potentially be lower because environment is accounting for the bigger percent of differences in intelligence. Again, genetic material is the same, but our environments, we have four entirely 
different environments. And as a result, we would assume heritability, heritability value is very low, potentially close to zero. We would say maybe, maybe there's a, a very small amount, but 0% heritability because they all have different environments sharing the same genes. As environment becomes more and more controlled, so we go from a very uncontrolled environment here to a very controlled environment here, then the difference in a behavioral trait or any trait, to be honest, or most traits, to be honest, um, these behavioral traits are more closely tied to heredity and the heritability of a given trait as compared to environmental influences. The subject of the next few slides is that of twin studies and adoption studies and helping us determine what's nature or the traits inherited by genetics that come from our parents and what's nurture or the traits that result from interactions with our environment. Ultimately, we can use both twin studies and adoption studies combined with information we might take from family pedigree analyses to provide more accurate estimates of genetic and environmental influences. So what are twin studies? Twin studies allow geneticists the ability to examine the overall roles genes play in the development of a trait, some kind of characteristic, or in some cases, disorders. These studies are done with the help of information about conditions and behaviors collected from monozygotic twins as well as dizygotic twins, and we'll define those in a moment. Overall, studies are then conducted to evaluate the degree by which a behavioral trait or some kind of a characteristic is genetically influenced or environmentally influenced. I want to point out again, twin studies involve comparing monozygotic twins to dizygotic twins. So before we go any further, let's go ahead and look here and make sure we're on the same page about these definitions. Monozygotic twins, often referred to as identical twins, develop from a single fertilized egg that splits into two in early development. We have one egg and one sperm, so twins sharing 100% of their genes. They share the same prenatal environment and share very similar external environments after birth. In contrast, dizygotic twins, called fraternal twins more commonly, develop from two separately fertilized eggs. So we have two eggs, two sperm, resulting in the sharing of 50% of their genes and being no more related than traditional siblings. However, in contrast to traditional siblings, they share a very similar prenatal environment as well as share a very similar external environment growing up. Lastly, we have traditional siblings. Traditional siblings also develop from two separate fertilized eggs, two eggs, two sperm, sharing 50% of their genes, being no more related than dizygotic twins. Because traditional siblings, though, are carried at different times, they share different prenatal environments as well as share different postnatal external environments. Granted, they merely live in the same household as other genetically re related family members. Their activities might be different. Going to school, they might have different teachers. They may have different friend groups. They may participate in different activities. So although we might see similar environment for traditional siblings, it isn't the same as saying we have a similar environment for our monozygotic or dizygotic twins that are born and raised and experiencing the same things at the same time. So let's say you're a scientist and you're interested in learning about what causes schizophrenia, one of the behavioral studies we'll consider in chapter eight. You might ask, is schizophrenia caused by genes or something people are exposed to in the environment? Maybe a toxin children are exposed to in childhood. And as a scientist, one thing you might have noticed in past research, children are more likely to develop schizophrenia if a parent has this disorder. And you might take that as an indication that there's a genetic component, and there might be. But one problem about drawing this conclusion is that we're not sure about the effects of the environment. It's entirely possible that both parents and children develop schizophrenia not because of some genetic component, but because there's some kind of a chem chemical in the environment triggering this disorder. Maybe there's something in a shared water source through the years, maybe something in the soil, maybe something in the air. 
And so what researchers want to do is isolate genes and their environment, separating those two, to look at one without the other to see whether or not we can get a clearer picture of what is actually causing the disorder. And one way we can do that is with twin studies. So we look at the rate of schizophrenia in identical twins and compare it to the rate of schizophrenia in fraternal twins. And what this allows us to do, it allows us to study the effects of genes while the environment is held constant. And so recall from earlier, we have <clears throat> identical twins share 100% of the same genes. And fraternal twins share 50% of their genetics. And they both share 100% of their environments. So if these two identical twins here grow up and share the same environment, and these identical twins here go on to grow up and share the same environment, what we'll find is if schizophrenia were primarily the result of genes, then you would expect to see different rates of a given disorder between identical and fraternal twins. Specifically, you would see that if one of the identical twins had schizophrenia, there would be a higher chance of the other twin having had schizophrenia as compared to the rates in fraternal twins. However, if this is a result of the environment, we would expect to see similar rates between identical twins versus fraternal twins. In summary, if identical twins who share approximately 100% of their genetic makeup resemble one another in behavior, some other behavioral trait, more than that of fraternal twins who share approximately 50% of their genetic makeup, then we could conclude that traits or characteristics of behavior would have a strong genetic component. And I just wanna point out, this is pretty clean cut here. We need a however, and in doing so, I will state a generality. It's difficult not to, even though this may not apply to all twin groups. Generally, identical twins may be treated more similarly than fraternal twins, especially when fraternal twins are boy-girl twins as compared to girl-girl or boy-boy twins. And this could have some kind of unexpected effect. For instance, it's possible that identical twins share even more of the same environment as compared to fraternal twins. So do keep that in mind as well. My last bit of information to contribute toward twin studies is in looking at some terminology that the textbook uses, specifically concordance and discordance. Simply put, concordance means agreement. When monozygotic twins are concordant for a given trait or behavior, it means the trait or behavior is present in both members of a pair of twins, or as the textbook states, concordance of a trait is the percentage of pairs in which both identical monozygotic twins express a given trait. In contrast, discordance is when twins differ in a given trait or behavior. That is, one twin shows the trait or behavior and the other doesn't, and they are said to be discordant for that trait. Concordance is usually expressed as a percentage. For instance, 100% concordance means all the twins share the behavior or the trait in common, whereas 0% concordance means none of them did, or they are discordant. Now, I put together this brief little graph that shows you some features and what to expect for concordance and discordance. When we talk about monozygotic concordance being significantly higher than con um, dizygotic concordance, the interpretation of that is the behavior is partly due to nature and genetics. If we say monozygotic concordance is similar to dizygotic concordance, what we're saying is behavior is entirely due to nurture or upbringing. When we say that monozygotic concordance is 100%, we are saying the behavior is entirely due to nature or genetics. And when we say monozygotic concordance is significantly less than 100%, that means we're saying behavior is partly due to nurture and partly due to nature. Another type of study used by psychologists and geneticists and other researchers that can help us study nature versus nurture are the adoption studies. And in these studies, individuals who are adopted are compared to their adoptive families as well as their biological families. 
And in doing so, making these comparisons, adoption studies look at the impact of environment on children raised by parents who are not their biological parents. Because there is no biological connection between parent and child, if a child grows up to share the adoptive parent's traits, then these traits are likely to be produced as a result of nature or the result of the environment. We can return to our schizophrenia example as we consider adoption studies. And if we discover that rates of schizophrenia in adopted children resemble the rates of schizophrenia in a biological family, but not the adopted family, then we conclude that there is a strong genetic component. But if we find there's no relation between an individual and their biological family, but if we find there's no relationship between an individual and their biological parents, but there are similar rates between adopted children and their adoptive parents, then we can say there's an important environmental role. So we could say strong environmental components. In the development of schizophrenia. So because adopted individuals are exposed to different environments than their biological relatives, it makes sense for researchers like psychologists and geneticists to study a behavior's environmental effects. But just like our twin studies, there are some problems with the methodology of using adoption studies to examine environmental versus genetic components. There are a multitude of influences affecting adoptees. There are environmental influences affecting the adoptee during fetal development, during delivery, and potentially immediately following delivery, um, which could include some genetic predispositions given environmental exposure. On the other side, we look at postnatal influences on the adoptee following placement with an adoptive family. I think it's worth mentioning adoption is not usually a completely random process. Adoption agencies carefully screen adoptive parents, placing children typically in older, more stable families with higher socioeconomic income brackets and with intact rather than single parent families. Some adoption agencies match parents they go a little further by matching up physical characteristics, including hair color and eye color, or on racial and ethnic origins, so as to help ensure a shared culture. Such selective placement might skew results as it impacts biological and environmental factors, making it more difficult to determine whether something is genetically driven or environmentally driven. This isn't across the board, but it's certainly worth pointing out. To conclude, I want to recap in a summary what we might expect to see if something is genetic or has a strong genetic link as compared to something being more environmentally linked from a twin versus an adoptive study perspective. If something is genetic, if a characteristic is genetic, then we would not expect to see the same rate of behavioral expression in identical twins as compared to fraternal twins. Specifically, we would expect to see a higher rate of behavioral expression in monozygotic twins as compared to fraternal twins. Further, we would see similar behaviors in adopted children and their biological parents. In contrast, if a characteristic is more environmental, then we would expect to see the same rate of behavioral expression in identical twins as compared to fraternal twins. Further, we would see similar behaviors between adopted children and their adoptive parents. Now we'll go ahead and move into chapter eight, where we'll consider more specifically the genetics of various behaviors. And I'll say up front, this topic of chapter eight, it's a slippery slope. We won't see firm and hard calculations and statistics. We can, under only very unique circumstances, use a Punnett square. For some behaviors we look at, for those genetic components, we might see countless genes coming into play, that idea of polygenic behavior. This chapter is going to serve as an introduction and simply give you an idea of some of the common behaviors that may have genetic components. And in the cases where some of those genetic components are known, we'll talk about them, maybe talk about them generally, or we may look at them more specifically. As I conclude this lecture of chapter seven, 
please be sure you understand the concepts of twin studies and adoption studies. Understand their differences as well as the limitations each have. We'll look at these in more detail when we come back for the second lecture of Module 6 where we're covering Chapter 8. And always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Meanwhile, make it a great day.